Hmm. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Geeky Justin Live. Game cards do not actually talk. My name is Justin Lee and with me today is Marcia Stevens Pino filling in at the last minute. Thank you, Marcia. How are you? Good. I'm great. So I, I have to tell everybody that you uh, were super, super gracious. Um, I had uh, somebody lined up to, to uh, be on the show tonight and we were going to do a show later on. You were on my list for a little, a little later uh, uh, down the road. And um, the person who was originally my guest for tonight, let me know today that she had lost power. The power went out where she was. Oh no. Yeah. And so um, I said, oh goodness, um, who can I get who's super gracious and could fill in <laughs> absolutely the last minute with, with no prep? <laughs> and Marsha agreed to do it. Um, so thanks so much for being here. Uh, uh, Marsha, I should tell everyone who's watching, um, is a, a Christian singer songwriter who has been doing this for, um, how many years now? 50. It'll be in, in 13 days, it'll be 50 years, <laughs> 50 years, which is an amazing <laughs> career. Um, wrote uh, a, a, a very, a, among other songs, a, a very famous uh, song for those tears I died and uh, has been, r runs a, a something called Balm Ministries, which stands for uh, Born Again Lesbian Music. Is that right? That's right. Um, <laughs> And and is just an incredible person who uh, is just seems to be friends with absolutely everybody. It's amazing how much your name comes up um, <laughs> when I talk to folks in the LGBTQ Christian world. It's like, you know, the, the number of people who said to me, oh, you know who you really need to get to be on on your show is Marcia Stevens Pino. And here she is. So. Um, so, uh, yeah. So that's a little bit of introduction. But what else should people know about you? Oh, it was it was kind of fun this weekend because yesterday was the 50th anniversary of me becoming a Christian. And for me, it wasn't something I was raised in. It wasn't, you know, my baptism or my confirmation. It was really a pivotal event in my life. I mean, I, you could count down from that day. And when, it, it rewrote my history, too, because it made me look back on a really troublesome childhood and go, you were there, you got me through that, you know? Mm. So that was really important to me, and it was really fun that I got to spend it in Florida with one of my favorite people, Riven Nancy Wilson. And um, You know, I'm celebrate. in Florida. Why am I not oh, I one didn't. of your favorite people that you're spending time with? I didn't know you were in Florida. <laughs> where are you? I'm in Orlando. Oh my gosh, that's where we flew in and out of. We just spent a long weekend there. Shoot. Well, <laughs> well, well, well next time, next time we'll hang out. Um, okay. So that's that's amazing. So so 50 years since you became a Christian. And the first thing that I wanted to do was be able to tell other people about it. And at the time, there were old hymns that were Christian. There were choir songs that were Christian. You know, we sing, praise ye the Lord, you know. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and there was Southern Gospel, which was, at least in my circle of friends, um, we would have called it hokey, but it was very um, stuff that used language that we didn't use, you know, that kind of thing, <clears throat> not music that we listened to. Mm. And so when I went back to school so excited, I wanted to tell everybody what had happened. And I, I didn't know how to say it. Mm. You know, I, uh, people either were, you know, like, well, you sound like my grandma or they were like, I want some of whatever you're smoking. And uh <laughs> <laughs> And so I finally thought, well, if I could kind of get the story into three verses, it, it might be a good idea to do that so that they could hear the whole thing before they had to stop and argue with me about it. Uh -huh. So I knew four chords on the guitar. And there wasn't such a thing as contemporary Christian music or even Jesus music at the time. In fact, the Encyclopedia of Contemporary Christian Music says that was the first song that was called Jesus music or contemporary Christian music. So that was kind of fun, but I didn't know at the time. I sang it for my kid sister. I sang it for my friends at school. I thought, good, I'm done. <laughs> so you were a Did. pioneer. <clears throat> I know. Troy Perry, from um, the founder of MCC Churches, 
told me, you know, the thing about being a pioneer is there's nobody there to cheer when you arrive. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, so when I, you're a pioneer, you don't really know it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's inspiration, though, I know, to a lot of folks who are <laughs> pioneers in their own way that it's it can be a very lonely space to be. So you were a pioneer in contemporary Christian music. Well, and in my hometown in Southern California, there were 2,000 kids in our high school, and me becoming a Christian made the front page of the school newspaper. Oh <laughs> so, I know. So, wow. I guess I was, I don't, I don't know if I was pushy or, but it, they didn't sound like that in the, in the newspaper, though. It just sounded like, wow, this really weird new thing's happening, you know. <clears throat> and Marsha can't stop talking about it. <laughs> so, um, when did you know that you weren't straight? You know, I I had more of a sense that I was different when I was younger. And um, in about 12 or 13, when all my friends started hoping that boys would crash the slumber party and stuff, and I thought, ew, <laughs> like, <laughs> bummer. Um, and I, I had gone to a library to try to figure out what it was when you, if you liked girls more than you liked boys. And it said, if you thought you had this disease, you should go to your school nurse or your pastor, which I thought was an incredible combination of people, your school nurse or your pastor. I mean, I wasn't going to go talk to my pastor. I, you know, church was just something your parents dragged you to. It had no impact on me. I was, I would never have spoken to him in any case. But um, I got three times into the school nurse's office and thought, there's no way <laughs> in this discussion. So I finally actually got a boyfriend um, who lived three hours from me at my near my aunt's home when she was uh, just north of the Mexican border. So she was three, he was three hours away and it was perfect because... I could say, oh, yeah, I can't be interested in it because I have a boyfriend. Now, we only saw each other maybe twice a year, but, but he wrote letters so I could prove that he was real. And that, you know, that just kind of made it really easy because I didn't have to date. I never dated anyone. I, I had a boyfriend, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when I, um, when I became a Christian, everything was so new. And I didn't think really, you know, it said if you have this disease – and I thought, well, whoever, whatever I was before, I must be cured of it, you know. So I didn't, it wasn't something that I'd like gone achingly out to understand or change, but I, I don't know, I just disregarded it. And of course, even then, even in early Christian circles, it was very important that you be chaste and that you be, you know, not with anyone until you're married. And, you know, I was that was easy, right? <laughs> so, you know, but once we started traveling and singing, we, we went to Azusa, we got scholarship to go to Azusa Pacific and um, started traveling and singing. And it just made sense to marry one of the guys in the group, mm -hmm. you know, a very nice guy, you know. And, and it wasn't until we were married that I realized, man, there's just like, we don't have a connection, you know. Um, Mm. We we tried really hard to have a connection, and he was he, and he he's been remarried for over thirty five years. So you know, he, it's not that he was a flake or anything. He he was a great dad, but we just couldn't stay connected. And we we went to counselors and tried all these sort of you know awkward uh, make a list of this and try these things you know stuff that we went down the list and tried, but nothing made us connect you know so it wasn't until we had gone through all of our counseling and all of the weird stuff that I thought you know what I I don't think I'm going to be with another guy <laughs> and <clears throat> so the first time that I had a crush on a woman that I kind of acknowledged and was aware of I was shocked and after a year when we finally developed a, rela a relationship that included a sexual relationship, um, my pastor, Chuck Smith, talked to me and he said um, that, that, you know, 
if, if Russ wasn't man enough to satisfy me, I could have found someone else. And I mean, oh it was like gosh. this completely bizarre conversation about you could have been divorced and remarried. And I thought, what's wrong with this? Um, but then he told me that he'd known that I was gay for over a year. Well, I hadn't even thought about being gay for a year yet. So I sat there and going, April, May, June, July. And honestly, he went right on talking, and I was sitting there thinking, wait, so if he knew, then that's somebody I am, not something I did. Hmm. You know, and that's when the light bulb went off for me that, Oh, oh, so if this isn't making a choice between person A and person B, this is who I am. Hmm. And if he knew it before it even occurred to me, I must be one. Hmm. <laughs> you know, it, it was really, it, it was such an odd place for it to come from. And yet it was probably the only person who could have said that that I would have listened to. Oddly. <laughs> I love Pastor Chuck. Well, so I... Uh... I should pause at this point to let you know that uh, a lot of folks uh, are in the live viewing audience and are uh, are excited and uh, and saying hi. Um, and uh, <laughs> uh, including uh, uh, Justin, who says, yay, hey, guys, not me, Justin, Justin, Ryan, Justin. <laughs> I know. Um, and uh and Jackie says, Marsha, you are so relatable. Oh, um, thank you. And uh, <clears throat> I had family and friends who knew I was gay before I did. And also asks me, right? is that a centerpiece cup? Because the mug I am using today for folks who are listening in on the podcast and uh, and do not uh, uh, can't can't see this. I I had recently on on the show. Uh, a woman named Sally Gary, who runs an organization called Centerpiece, uh, which I always have to spell out for the audio listeners, P-E-A-C-E, that is doing great work with LGBTQ uh, Christians and allies. And I was just at her retreat and she sent me home with with a lot of love from that whole group of folks who were there and with the Centerpiece mug. So today I'm drinking out of the Centerpiece mug. Um... So, okay, so so I I want to, uh, I'm going to say a couple things up front here. One is that I have promised to inject more geeky stuff into this show. People have said to me, you're geeky, Justin. There, We need to talk more about geeky stuff on the show and not <laughs> just LGBTQ Christian stuff. And I say, okay, but I have a lot of good LGBTQ Christian stuff to talk about and people to bring on. Um, but at some point... Marsha, just to warn you, we're going to talk about something geeky at some point today. You want you want to know the time recently that I was a geek? Yes. We only we only recently moved to Nashville, Tennessee. My wife's work brought us here, and for whatever reason, the Lord led us to the Methodist Church. Uh, this is like an eight thousand member Methodist Church, where on one hand you'd think you'd just disappear, but you know that doesn't happen with me. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't <laughs> happen with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, so probably 4,000 to 8,000 people now know us. But I sat down with the bulletin. I moved, I moved from Florida mm. to Nashville. So I sat down with the bulletin the first time I said, oh, honey, look, look at all this stuff they have. They have buckets of things for seniors to do, like lists of days and stuff to do. And I started going through it. And we found a couple of things that we thought sounded really fun. And I called the church office and I said, so how old do you have to be to do these senior things? Because my wife's two years younger than I. And um, she said, well, it's no particular age. You just have to be a senior. And I said, okay, I get that. But like kind of what do you count as a senior? And she said, well, no matter what age you are, if you're a senior in high school, you can participate. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder they sounded like fine, right? <laughs> oh all right yes yeah, seniors senior stuff happens in florida not in nashville okay got it <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic i love that story well are so okay are, are you 
um i want to talk more about your story but are you a geek about anything like for me like i define a geek as somebody who like (laughs) just gets really like you get really really into something whether it's technology or pop culture or video games or anime or books or what like people are geeks about different things and i think i really have to tell you that yes i want to (laughs) know my my granddaughter sends me all kinds of star trek stuff because she he knows how into it I am. And I don't know if you saw the one that was making the rounds recently where it says, during Pride Month this month, let's celebrate that the Klingons accepted trans people. And it shows this rough, gruff Klingon guy hugging this woman and saying, Gorgon, my old friend. And and the, and the other person and says, oh, I'm Jadzia now. And it's clearly a woman. And he says, Jadzia, my old friend. <laughs> Like no change, you know, mm. and and then it says, see, you know, no big deal, just just a little self adjustment in the word and the name, and then we go right on with the same amount of love and respect. So she sent me all these pictures of all the Klingons. <laughs> that oh, only people in my family would know to do. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, so I I have to ask you then, if you're a Star Trek fan, what's what's your favorite Star Trek series? You know, I mean, I could. I could probably, I, in fact, I did win at a, a contest once at a Star Trek convention for quoting the most dialogue in, in original Star Trek without making a mistake. Um, I know, wow. isn't that sad? But <laughs> I should have, I okay, should have led with that. Contemporary Christian music, <laughs> nothing. We should have led with that. <laughs> I, I went to Gene Roddenberry's funeral with Majel Barrett. Um, <gasps> I know. Really? Total geek. I got it. That is amazing. So, yeah, I'm actually on the video. I, when his son did, golly, I can't remember. I can't remember what the title of this, you know, sort of uh, in-house video was that his son did, but it had pictures at the funeral, and I could I could find me, you know, <laughs> at the funeral. But I think I think the one I actually ended up liking better was next generation i really loved it that they had a you know regardless of how tight their uniforms were and that sort of sexist (laughs) thing but still i love that they had a psychologist on deck i thought there you go that's where psychologist belongs on deck yeah (laughs) you know making the decisions with everybody so i don't know i really like that yeah she was now do i officially seem geeky (laughs) yes I love it. She was a great character too. Um, when, when the writers were using her well and not just using her for sex appeal, she was. And and one and one of the scenes. Now, see how animated I get when I start talking about this. So, <laughs> in one of the scenes, she was, she was playing. You know, her psychologist character had been I don't know infiltrated by aliens or whatever, and so she had lost all of her empathy, and. She went to talk to this, and this was this is totally how I'd be as a psychotherapist. She's going to talk to this ensign, and she's all, you know, got her hair all fluffed, and she's sitting so pretty, and she says, so, Ensign Jones, how is that going with your lieutenant? And Ensign Jones says, you know, I tried everything you said, Deanna, I, or Troy, or whatever they call her. Uh, you know, I tried everything you said, and I put all the papers in the right place, and he still just came in and yelled at me and threw the papers, and I don't know what to do, and... She says, same composure. She says, has it ever occurred to you that maybe your lieutenant is as sick and tired as I am of your whining? <laughs> but, oh, that is totally me as a therapist. <laughs> so that's not your calling, we've established. No. <laughs> I always liked Deanna Troy because I always felt, um, I... I, I like I I always I felt very similar to that character like I like her character and the the like empathy thing for her like, yeah re- really resonates with me it's like I think I probably in an, in another life could have been a a therapist you know if I hadn't been doing what I'm doing now but okay yeah. I love I... that that's fantastic <laughs> so we got some geeky stuff in right here early on in the show but I, okay so let's talk more about about like you've you've been doing uh well contemporary christian music for a long time you've seen all the changes uh over the years in contemporary christian music but also 
when did you first come out in the like Christian world? I came out. I, I became a Christian and started singing in 69 and did that for 10 years. And and it was really during the 10 years in which contemporary Christian music went from there's no reason to write this other than to sing it to your friends because nobody's recording it or broadcasting it or anything to, you know, by the time I left contemporary Christian music, we had a record agency and a booking agency and a promotion agency. And, you know, like it was like ridiculous. Um, so I came out in 1980, and for almost four years, I just stayed away from everything to do with church. I, I mean, I, I I never didn't believe, but I just thought this is just going to have to be something that we do at our home privately, because I'm not going to ever find anybody who understands me. And um, somebody told me about MCC and Troy Perry in 1984, so I went to see him speak in Southern California. <clears throat> and I thought it, it wouldn't have surprised me at all for it to be a drag show and somebody pretending to be Catherine Coleman. You know, I just thought it was going to be a joke, you know, hmm. but I went to hear him and he, he was very powerful and, you know, really King James is my primary language. So, you know, I totally understood everything he was saying and every illusion that he made in his talking. And he looked over the corner of the room at me and I knew he saw me. Because I was, you know, more well known then, and I thought, oh my gosh, he's going to say something. He did. He said, "I see somebody here today, Marsha. I just want you to come up here." And I'm like, "Why would I go up there? Are you kidding me?" <laughs> <laughs> so I went up and sang, wow. and um, and he said, "I need you to start doing this. You need to start doing this for our community." So there's this this uh conference coming up and I want you to write a song for that and then I want you to write a song for this and I said I don't do this anymore and he said Marsha how, how do you know it wasn't for such a time as this and he just stopped there he didn't finish the quote which spoke to me in a different way than it would have if he would have said the whole you know this is from the book of Esther da, 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 you know that he was just speaking my language you know how do you know it wasn't for such a time as this that you came into the kingdom just like Esther saved her Jewish people by coming out to the king as Jewish. And I just sat there while he was talking to me and thought, I don't know if I can even wrap my head around that. And so I did sing at the conference that he asked me to. And the next week in the mail, I got a letter from Ralph Blair. And I thought, oh, my gosh, somebody in New York knows I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> and that. We, we should say who Ralph Blair is for people who don't know that name. Um, Dr. Ralph Blair is a psychologist in uh, New York, and he started early, early on working with the American Psychological Association, taking um, homosexuality off of the diagnostic and statistical manual as an illness. And, and he's a wonderful counselor and therapist, but he also started Evangelicals Concerned, which was a kind of, a, it was intended to be a place where you could keep going to your own church, but have a fellowship of people who understood you that would help you come out in your own church. So like they didn't meet on Sunday mornings. They had evening Bible studies and meetings and conferences and whatnot so that people could become firm in their own faith and still be, you know, going to the Baptist church with their parents. Yeah. <clears throat> and Evangelicals Concerned is still around in New York City. Still They're great. led by yeah. Ralph Blair. Uh, so, so what's your sense um you you have a lot more experience than uh, probably a lot of the folks who are watching and listening right now um of the shifts that have happened in the the sort of LGBTQ Christian movement and the church's approach to sexual orientation and gender identity and and all of that stuff um, what's your sense of how things have changed or not changed uh, over one, time? One story I tell, and I mean, I know that this isn't this isn't the total answer, but one story that I tell, I'm, I'm a registered nurse. I got my my nursing license so that I could so that I was never fleecing the flock, that I was never saying, "Oh, please have me come to your church because I need the money," you know. Mm. And so I have a license in 26 states. I can just drop in and work somewhere at a hospital. And um, and 
I did a lot of that, especially during the AIDS crisis. But when I first became a nurse, universally, people said, you will never get doctors to stop smoking in the hospital. I don't care how many rules you make. I don't care what anybody says. You will never get them to stop smoking in a hospital. And you know that there's not a doctor <laughs> in, in the nation that smokes in his hospital anymore, you know, mm. his or her hospital. But um, so just to say things certainly have changed, you know, um, and, and it's certainly possible for things to change. So even things that we just think are super entrenched. I think what's hard is that there's a huge section of believers that I'll use the term loosely rather than say Christians, a huge section of believers who have so much contact with gay people and so much understanding of what their what our lives are like, you know, how we interact with the world and society that there's been a huge normalization there, but there's still a part of the church that says the very same thing. Now, they might have changed on women, and they might have changed on, especially they've changed on divorced people. You know, they really couldn't stick to the no divorced people are going to be in ministry here because they wouldn't have ministers, just like they wouldn't have music ministers if they really stuck to the gay thing. But anyway, <laughs> um, and... And I think that that's hard for younger people who just go, oh, my gosh, why are you still talking about that? Hmm. You know, because they've sort of grown up in a culture of, you know, it's way more interesting that, you know, my, my grandson talk, says, you have three co colors of hair, Girl Marsha, and people are very a lot more interested in my hair than they are in the genitalia of the person I'm married to. You know? Right. It's like, I guess you they always been that long. And, you know, that's like way more of a topic of conversation. But when my daughter, my daughter's now 46, when she was in grad school, they asked her to be on a group of people from different family backgrounds. And they were very solicitous about that. Now, is it okay with you to do this? She said, the only problem you're going to have with me is I have the most boring conservative family in the hall room. You know, and that was news to them. They mm. thought that we, she'd be you're like kind of revealing the inside of a whole different life, you know, what the <laughs> heck? She had two mothers looking out for her, you know, it was twice as strict, I mean, you know, mm. so that's, that's become a little more well-known, I think. Um, and I, I try to encourage people to come out both because, you know, when we walk in the light as God is in the light, that's when we have fellowship one with the other. But, also because, you know, the, the people that say it's nobody else's business, there are people at my church that are gay that don't, nobody knows they're gay but me, you know, mm. and they say it's nobody else's business. And I think, I, I told my mom once, go one whole week and don't tell anybody that dad's your husband, just a week. Hmm. So no pictures on your table, no pictures on your desk at work, no couples weight watchers. No square dancing. They love to square dance. No holding hands on your walks. No Mr. and Mrs. You know, nobody. I mean, she couldn't get through a day without calling me and going, I had no idea how much I talked about it. You mm -hmm. know? So when you just, I don't know, there's something so broken about hiding that part of your, hiding a whole section of your life and telling yourself that you're doing it because it's nobody's business that's, come a long way I think people are realizing that in order to really have fellowship you kind of have to have people let people know who you are yeah I mean that's that's a it's a great point and it's something that uh, you know for folks who who um, accuse gay and bi folks of uh, you know flaunting their sexual right? orientation by talking about their significant other or whatever it's it's a little absurd you know for the reason you just said um by the way i have to i have to uh come over here to some of the comments when you were talking about uh all of the different groups that still have been have been ostracized uh by the church in, in you know over the decades uh one of our commenters amy wrote uh oh 
I'm a divorced trans pastor. I guess I'm screwed. <laughs> so <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, uh, and also, I need to tell you that uh, there were some some uh, big uh, proponents of, of Deep Space Nine earlier when we were talking about best Star Trek, but oh. you made some people happy with uh, with Next Generation. <laughs> Next Generation. <laughs> um, yeah. The Ferengi were fun, but yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that, that in, at least in some parts of the church, it's no longer the issue that it was, um, that people would be more interested in your hair than in, you know, the, the gender of your partner. Um, but at the same time it still is you know an issue in some parts of the church which is it's oh it gosh. creates this weird uh this weird situation where it's sort of like i have friends who live in some parts of the country some parts of the world some parts of the church uh who are like oh thank goodness this isn't an issue anymore that you know that it's all nobody cares anymore and then other folks in other areas who are like oh my gosh, like I'm terrified to even tell anybody that I'm an ally, much less, you know, come out or anything because of the level of vitriol still. Um, it's Oh, I know. It's We go we go to a Methodist church, United Methodist Church that's just been through that whole, you know, not only are you still not allowed to become a minister or be married in the church, but we will punish anybody who, you know, goes along with that. Um, we may have to switch to another thing because my battery is low and I can't plug in my phone when I'm on the, Oh no. (laughs) Yeah. This is the consequence. This is the consequence of, uh, last minute jumping into the thing. Um, okay. So here's what we'll do. We can, we'll, we'll take a quick pause. We've never done this before. We'll take a quick pause. That's all right. We'll take a quick pause, uh, for Marsha to switch over and um and then we'll be right back so please stand by just a moment (laughs) we'll be right back okay we are back i think yes (laughs) so we it's um can i can i tell them about the conversation we had about your laptop and your and your uh phone before we started (laughs) so vanity vanity okay yes (laughs) So earlier, when we were testing the connection before the show, um, we uh, we we first tried connecting through Marsha's laptop, and the camera on the laptop is um, weirdly uh, making her her teeth look strange, like like she she said like she's got spinach in her teeth or something. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, we switched over to her, her phone and uh, everything uh, looked great, much better. And so uh, we said, well, let's go with the phone. But now the phone has died. So um, but just to be clear to everyone, Marsha does not have <laughs> spinach or anything else wrong with her teeth. That is her camera. <laughs> that was see, so now, nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> you <laughs> now folks have seen the first half they've there seen you. the first half so they know that your teeth are fine and it's your <laughs> your laptop <laughs> camera it's worse right. the more you make me laugh <laughs> what's that it's worse the more you make me laugh yeah <laughs> well and then apparently when i said that my phone just thought that um that i was calling siri up for some reason and tried to talk back to me so you know, we're just we're breaking all kinds of boundaries um, on this live show. Uh, Siri makes its first appearance and and switching cameras and having a break in the middle of the show and all kinds of fun, exciting stuff. The folks who didn't tune in for this, they don't know what they're missing. Also, I think this is the first I think this is the first episode that I've done where I wasn't drinking tea. Because I went to make my tea right before we started, and my hot water dispenser is empty. Somebody used the last hot water, and so I had to put a sparkling water thing in into my centerpiece mug. Nothing like tea. 
All right, Amy wants you to know that your teeth look great. Thank you. So, <laughs> um, all right. So, um, let's. Uh, oh, so Justin Ryan wants everyone to know. Uh, and I was going to get to this later in the show, but we'll get to it right now. He wanted everyone to know while we were on that quick, uh, you know, two minute break that they can go to uh, check out your music on your website at balmministries.net. So there it is. It's Balm, B-A-L-M. The Balm the balm came because the first time I went to an MCC near me, I, I don't even know why I made an impression on anyone, but but I had my kids every other weekend, so I went on the weekend without the kids. So I missed a week, and when I came back, just as I was walking into the church, I just had this moment of, are you and I okay, Lord? You know, and this woman, I really hadn't even, prayer hadn't even hardly left before she came running out to the parking lot and put a pin on me that said, and she said, I found this at Pride and it was just so you, I had to get it. And I went, didn't know what Pride was. <laughs> and <laughs> I thought, I looked down and it said, born again lesbian. And I thought, wait, if they made a button, that means there's more of us. Mm. <laughs> so that's how I ended up calling it born again lesbian music. <laughs> yeah. I like that. I like that. That's I mean, that's such a revelation for so many folks, this idea like I'm not alone. And I think that's so important to know that you're not alone. Um, so, boy, well, OK, so there are unexpected interruption got me kind of off track in terms of what I was thinking. But we were we were talking about things, ways that things have changed. Um, and I. I um, yeah, I. I it, there was something I was going to say about that, and now it's completely left <laughs> me. I'm so sorry. Well, We're that's having... okay. The, the The Methodist thing has been really hard because oh yeah, it's it's like it's like going back in time twenty years, you know, to talk to like my wife. I you know half the things I get away with I get away with because you cannot lo not love my wife. She's on every mission trip. She's on every habitat build. You know, anybody who needs help, she's there all the time. And and even things that I don't even know about. For for over a year now, she's been taking people from her work downtown Nashville um, out to out to feed people at a lunch place every Friday. And and I only heard about it, you know, accidentally because she said, you know, her car broke down or she needed gas because she couldn't get to the lunch place. I said, what lunch place? I mean, she just does this stuff constantly. She's won more community awards than I could even think of. And so to come to a church and be somebody who's so involved and then have them all of a sudden do this, oh, no, we want to affirm that, you know, I mean, the core of it is that homosexuality is contrary to Christian teaching that's the quote and then they don't support gay marriage and they don't support ordination of anybody who's gay and then they have a whole thing about what gay means you know if you're uh, self-avowed or if they can find out on the internet or if you're married to someone of the same gender all those things count as gay just so you know um so but yet then when I went to the senior pastor of this 8,000 member church and I said, so you know Cindy and I? And he said, of course I do. I, you know, I mean, I do little volunteer things. I, I don't have that kind of energy. But, you know, I clean the bulletins out of the church pews in a great big church. I mean, that's not a big deal, but I can do that on my own time. It's not physical exertion, but we're involved. And we lead music at the women's retreats and stuff. But um, I said, do you, so I just want to know, do you ever look at us and just think, man, those are really sweet women. It's too bad they don't just repent and get a divorce and marry guys. <laughs> and he said, no. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> then, yeah. then why don't you say that? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. It's, well, that's so. one of the things I think that's, that's changed actually, uh, is, is how, people coming out I mean people like you who've been pioneers um, not only in terms of music but just by being out there with your story um, I was the first contemporary Christian music person to openly say that I was gay yeah and that's 
that's huge because it's through our stories and through humanizing um, these these questions that people do change their minds. That that uh, you know it becomes less about the 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 issue of homosexuality, which sounds very scary, and just like these two wonderful women I know, and gosh, I would never say boy, I hope you get a divorce because, you know, clearly they've got something good. I mean, like there's something about that that does eventually change people's hearts and minds. Yeah, even 20 years ago, Christian Century published an article called Marsha's Tears about the song and um, said she's conservative Christianity's worst nightmare, a Bible-believing, God-fearing, Jesus-loving lesbian Christian. (laughs) And I... (laughs) As funny as that sounds, I'll take that. But I don't think they would say that anymore. You know, they wouldn't need to. Mm. to I, th- I think that it wouldn't apply as generally 20 years later. That that might be my tagline for this episode. What was that? Conservative Christianity's worst nightmare? Is that what it was? Conservative Christianity's worst nightmare. A Bible-believing, God-fearing, Jesus-loving, lesbian Christian. I'm just going to tell people that you're... I'm just going to go dot, 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 Christianity's worst nightmare, dot, 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 and just let that be the tag. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> folks, folks watching on the feed are wanting to know about your um, ministry and, and what you do, and do you continue to perform and all that jazz. So um, tell us. Especially this year. I mean, we're, the 50th anniversary tour is going to go all year. So I'm headed to Northern California next. Then I'll be back um, in July, back in Orlando, um, for to sing at uh, MCC's. I, I sing with Troy Perry when he opens MCC's general conference, and then I sing for those tears I died the morning that general conference opens in Orlando. So, yeah, and then we go from there. So, yeah, the 50th anniversary tour is fun. The thing is, I used to travel on a bus. I mean, we had no physical address. I actually had to register to vote as homeless because we lived we lived in a bus. We didn't have any other dwelling, you know. So, so for 19 years, I registered to vote as homeless. Wow. <laughs> they don't they don't let you register at a PO box. So, huh. And then Heather wants to know, is Balm Ministries looking for new gay Christian artists? Is there a need for that? Well, there's always a need for people reaching out. Um, For a while, for several years, Cindy and I did classes. We called them upbeat. For people who, people people were at all different levels of either I want to become a music leader at my church, I want to form a praise band, I want to sing at different churches, I want to know how to get music published, I want to know how to get music copyrighted, you know, kind of all levels of things. And so we did, I think, 10 of those that some of the people were, the people that went on the road were there for a year, that's where Justin Ryan um, went through the first class and then helped us with the other classes and he was on the road in our bus for a year. So we did a lot of that, but really right now, especially because we had to move and Cindy's job is so overwhelming, we're, all I'm doing is flying out for the concerts for the 50th anniversary tour. Do you have suggestions for folks who, um, you know, maybe like LGBTQ folks who are Christians who would like to, who, you know, have uh, musical talent and, and are looking for a, a way to use their gift? Well, um, I mean, first of all, I think you need to think locally, not globally, you know, mm. um, and and think about the people who are right around you who need to hear your story and your message. But um, I also think that sometimes it's really good to get involved with, like, the Reformation Project, some of the, or MCC churches. Some of them have local conferences or larger conferences where when you sing at one place people see what your gifts are and you know it kind of broadens the scope of where you might be invited to sing but in general I think you know it's it's easy it's easier to keep your heart in the right place if you start with the people right around you who need you Mm. Yeah, that's always the challenge. I think we we live in a world right now where everybody is focused on 
and I don't mean just musicians. I mean everybody is going viral. On yeah, how do I go viral? How do I build my platform? How do I get you know a million views and likes and shares and um, and it the it's not that simple. And the reality is sometimes the sacrifices that people make to get those things they they really do. It's like they lose part of themselves in the process. Um, I, so I appreciate that advice. Diane wants to know, Marsha, is there any music you have written in the past that you find contrary to what you believe now? That's a boy. That's a sure. weird question. <laughs> oh, that's true, though. That's true. There was one song that I wrote um, that, you know, um, talk, I'm trying to think of the rest of it. I hate myself in my heart. I, I don't want to be me. I just want to be Jesus. You know, that kind of message. Um, Try to the fire, let my life be laid down. But, you know, I particularly I remember the line, though I hate myself in my heart, and thinking that that was good, you know, that I would just hate myself and only want to be Jesus. And I, I would never think that today. I would think that God made me for a reason and the way I am for the reason and took me through the things I've been through for a reason. And, you know, it, I, I, I understand that we could get into, did he cause that or did God cause that or is God just using that? But I, I definitely think that I, I do ministry that no one else could do. And I think you do ministry that no one else could do. And I think each of us do ministry that wouldn't be possible from anyone but who God made you to be. Hmm. I that really resonates with me. The there is this there is this kind of um, way of of thinking about Christianity that is so self deprecating. It's so focused on like um, you know not I but Christ, which I think that like not I but Christ is like is is like understood in the right context is a is a you know like th that it's about Christ it's not about kind of glory for me and all that like I think that's healthy but where it becomes that like I hate myself um there is something deeply unhealthy there that that it's because God loves you and created you and if we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves well that involves loving ourselves not not in a prideful, better than others, look down on others kind of way, but in a, I am a child of God. I am loved by God. God created me on purpose and loves me with all of my mistakes and flaws. God loves me and I need to see that if I'm going to be of any use to, to God in, in loving others. And that is, I think, a deeply important message for a lot of folks, but especially for a lot of LGBTQ folks who have been put in a position of hating ourselves. Um, when we when we did an album, when we asked for um, people to send in uh, their songs so that we could consider recording them, we were doing a group album. And by the time we got to the studio, long story, but anyway, one of the songs when people send in a demo tape, you don't expect them to be fabulous vocalists. They're just trying to let you hear their song, right? Mm -hmm. So so it didn't surprise me that she wasn't a fabulous vocalist, but she sang, To me to live is Christ and to die be to gain. He's everything that I am. Life without him just wouldn't be the same. And I just thought, well, that's, I get it. That's sweet. You know, I, I understand where she's coming from. And then the chorus was, so kill me, kill me, kill me. Now I'm dead. Kill me, kill me, kill me. Now I'm dead. I mean, <laughs> you know, we went around all week long every time somebody made a flub in the, in the recording studio and had to start over, we'd go, kill me, kill me, kill me. But she was serious. She really meant that, you know, that was it's hard. That's a great example of how we have to be careful in pulling phrases and metaphors out of scripture, out of context, because there is this metaphor of like, you know, dying to ourselves and living in Christ, you know, in scripture, but it is is understood in a particular context. And wow, that is 
I'm sure well intentioned, but not not. I quite. know it was it was heartbreaking. It yeah. was also funny though. <laughs> CJ wants me to ask you about your new song, "The Silence of Our Friends," which I don't. Oh, know. oh, I sang it to you before we started this. You must have been heating oh. up your heating up your knot tea or something. But um, <laughs> oh, that's that song. Okay, okay, okay sorry. Yes. Yeah, it, it's a it's a canon, and I wrote it like around, you know, like row 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 your boat. Um, but I wrote it to do with an instrument because the person who asked me to write it plays professional French horn, and I thought I don't know how to write anything for voice and French horn unless it's just a like a round. So it's a sort of haunting melody, um, and it goes in these days of joys and of sorrows, in times of beginnings and ends. We'll remember far less the words of our foes than the silence of our friends. And that goes on to the other part of the canon. But we've been doing that, um, especially recently at the Methodist Church, because like I said, these people love us. And they, after a couple of years, they actually got to where they'd say Marsha and her wife instead of that Marsha and her uh, uh <laughs> you know, partner yeah. thing, um, and uh, and and they they all call me her wife and her my wife now, um, and I you know I know that a lot of people struggle with that name, but I feel like it kind of settles it for people though. You know what I mean? Then nobody's guessing what you're saying anymore. It's like it, it's like okay, that's what you are. Um, I do say spouse a lot, but anyway, they've they've gotten there, but. Then they're then they're silent, you know. Then they're mm. not. So that's that's been something that we've been doing a lot of. That's a, I mean that is a, it's. Boy, that's a that's a challenge when when folks know that that there's injustice happening when they know that there are people who are hurting, um, and they don't take action and they stay silent. I mean, there was a guy in uh, my one of my Bible study classes at at the church that said he was, you know, there's a certain ministry of people that do greeting and answering the phones, just you know, for a short time. And it was his turn to answer the phones, and a woman called, and and you know, there's so much segregation in the South still; it's just shocking, and um, especially having grown up in Southern California. <laughs> Yeah. The ultimate melting pot. Um, and he said, she asked him, you know, I was, I'm was i African-American. I was at your church last week, and I didn't see anybody else who's African-American. What's your stand on black people? Well, there you go. What an opening, right? Mm. He said, we don't have any stand on black people. I'm like, no. Oh, dear. <laughs> the answer is, oh, my gosh, I missed you. Please come again so I can meet you and bring your family. No, mm. I, it's just, it's just people don't see it, you know, and especially us, you know, middle class white folks just passes right by so much of us, you know. To me, it's heartbreaking that anyone, LGBTQ, person of color or otherwise, would ever feel the need, and yet so many of us do, to ask a church or an institution or a person what their stand is on us as human beings that is a horrible thing because people are not issues and stories like that kill me yeah i well when we first came here i wrote to several different churches and said you know we're gay we're not going to come picket your church but if we join a church we're in you know we're there all week long we're involved so let me know right now if that's going to be a problem. And several churches said, well, you could come, but you couldn't join, you know, all these little things. But one church actually wrote me back and said, oh, you'll be fine. We don't pay much attention to the Bible here. It won't be a problem. <laughs> but <laughs> somehow that's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, we're about out of time, but I want to okay. give you a chance to say anything that you want to say about anything, but also to say something about how people can get in touch with you. We kind of touched on this already, but we'll do it again. Um, for folks who want to 
learn about your music and hear you and and support you and, and invite all you that. to their church and invite and, you to their church absolutely yeah and one really cool thing right now is that we have a lot of people who are supporting the 50th anniversary tour so people aren't having to bear the whole burden of the expenses of flight and stuff because we've had people that have volunteered to help with we just did a little tiny church that couldn't possibly have afforded to have us but we had supporters do that so um my my email address is s s b a l m don't laugh at aol dot com and <laughs> you laugh. I already knew that web- was your address, and I still laugh. And the website is balmministries dot net. Balmministries dot com gets you there too, but it's balmministries dot net, and there's a place to get in touch with us about booking. That would be really fun. And the songs are downloadable. They're there. Awesome. So balmministries.net, B-A-L-M, Born Again Lesbian Music, ministries.net. I always tell people it's B-A-L-M, it's Born Again Lesbian Music, but we don't make you write lesbian on your check. You can just write balm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, 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 I'm so glad that you're in the world and um, so glad for all of your pioneering and and work that you've done because I know that – you didn't, you know, I kind of wanted to give you a chance to, to, to talk about how difficult it was, uh, you know, back in the beginning when you were doing your, and you, you didn't, you didn't take that bait, you know, you focused on positive things and I appreciate that. But, but I know, because I know that when I started doing my work, uh, it was difficult. And I know that you've been doing this longer than me and it's, is not an easy even today is not an easy thing to be an out person in many parts of the church. Well, you know what's weird is that it was actually harder for me to write the book that I just wrote about those times than it was to go through them. Because in the middle of them, I was so sure that God was with me always. I never doubted that. That, But then going back and writing about them was actually very, very difficult, harder than it was to go through them the first time. <laughs> So is the book is that book available or going to be available? Yes, it's on the website for those tears I died. Okay, so check out the book as well at balmministries.net. Um, Marcia, thank you so much. Thank Thanks for, for having me. I'm really glad you did this. I I I loved it, and I I wish we had more time. I should say thank you uh, to all my Patreon patrons who make it possible to do these uh, things. And especially to my gold star patrons, Terry, Tom, Liz, Larry, John, Carol, and Bruce. And also, I want to tell everybody that special announcement. This week, there's going to be an extra show on Thursday. Thursday, I think Thursday, Thursday. We're going to go with Thursday. Um, Because, as I mentioned, I originally had somebody scheduled uh, who wasn't Marsha for this evening. And now we're still going to have that conversation, but it's going to be on Thursday. So you got two shows this week. So um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, Marsha. And uh, remember, you can catch the all the past shows and everything uh, at YouTube.com slash Geeky Justin or on iTunes. Look up Geeky Justin Live. Go to my website, GeekyJustin.com. Go to Marsha's website at BallMinistries.net. And have a wonderful evening be excellent to each other and party on dudes <laughs> don't forget the nuance good night hmm